Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor for me to be speaking at this conference. Ah, thank you. Can you hear me better now? Okay. Okay, so um, I wanted to give you an idea of how I began working on this project. I was actually working on a project on language discrimination in Italy at the time uh, about the Napolitano dialect. And I, as I was looking through Italian newspapers, I kept coming across articles uh, reporting crimes supposedly committed by Romanis. And I knew that at the time uh, there were harsh policies of the Italian uh, Prime Minister's government, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, many human rights violations of Romanis in Italy. And at the same time, I, I happened upon some crimes committed by the Mafia, and I noticed a completely different tone. And so I thought, what, what's going on here? So I decided to investigate further, and my goal became to understand the media's role in the negative presentation of Romanis and positive presentation of Mafia groups in online newspapers. I looked at from the years 2005 to 2010, and I examined crime reports depicting crimes from both groups. There are a number of theories and studies that I drew upon for my research, but unfortunately I don't have much time, so if you want have any questions about it afterwards, feel free to ask. Um, uh, also, the work of Nando Sigona was very important to me, and Santa Ana's 1999 study. So looking, getting straight to the results, um, I conducted a corpus analysis first to look for patterns and ranks and frequencies, and then <clears throat> I categorized the terms into naturalization, denaturalization, and derogation. And some of you might not be sure what I mean by nat denaturalization. I'm talking about the act of making something appear less natural or less human. And this serves to justify the denigration of certain groups of people. And so what I found in the results of the Romani crime reports were many, many examples of denaturalization and derogation and very few examples of naturalization. And some of the items here I've listed um, Nomads, tracks, foaming at the mouth, dirty, apartment rats, a cloud of little kids, amassed, uh, dumped, and piled up, and so on. And I just want to point out about the term nomadi. Um, I believe Sandra asked a question about that before. And this term has really become to index Rome, which is what uh, Romanis are referred to in Italy. And it refers to the past uh, itinerant lifestyle. However, what you should know is that Technically, only about 4% of Romanis in Italy actually have an itinerant lifestyle anymore. And of this 4%, it's actually less because how many of those are actually moving because their homes were burned down and they're forced to evacuate? I don't define that as being nomadic. Uh, so, unfortunately, this term persists and is very effective in denaturalizing Romanis and making them appear as less human, less like us. Uh, and this term also leads to the semiotic process of erasure, which is when we render through ideology actions, peoples, or events invisible. And so um, since uh, the term has been so commonly used that Italians equate nomadi to Rome, which leads to sentences like the following becoming the norm. Sospettati dell'omicidio sono tre giovani nomadi stanziali. So suspected of the homicide are three young sedentary nomads. How can you be sedentary and nomad at the same time? Well, it, it doesn't make sense. But what's happening here is that the term nomadi has become so naturalized that the true meaning of the word has been become effectively erased. And, and people are no longer thinking of the definition. It just means Rome. And so it's working at the subconscious level to denaturalize. So we're not, they're not even aware of what the term means um, and that it doesn't apply any longer. Another thing that I found in my linguistic analysis is examples of the linguistic system of transitivity. And what, hap what happens here is that we have negative actions of Romanis being used 78% of the time in the active. So for example, they robbed, they attacked, they pushed. When we have negative actions of police or non-Romanis toward Romanis, 46%, only 46% of the examples were in the active and actually 54% were in the passive, such as they were sentenced, they were arrested, they were stopped. And also the omission of the agent in negative actions toward Romanis appears to be a pattern and occurs in 72% of passive sentences in texts with law enforcement as the agent. So, doesn't say who did it, right? 
So what's happening is by choosing a different type of process, active versus passive, or in this case passive versus active, the author downgrades the power of police and negative actions and upgrades the power of Romanis and negative actions, thus providing a very subtle way of representing this group negatively. And this is why we need this kind of analysis, because this is not available to us. We're not going to pick up on this just by reading. Uh, this is something very systematic and it's very subtle. <coughs> All right, and just to give you an example of a nonverbal element examined, in keeping with my discourse historical approach, I also looked at uh, government websites that were trying to justify Romani policies in Italy. This photo was found on the Italian government official website and was published in response to the Human Rights Commission and European Parliament complaints about gov Italian government policies regarding <coughs> Romanis. And while the text defends Italy's policies in light of trying to help the Romani people, this photo does the opposite. And the title, L'Italia non è un paese razzista, uh, if you know anything about racist discourse, you know this is usually an introduction to racist discourse, as in, I'm not racist, but. Um, and there are many disturbing things about the photo, but I just want to talk about three things, according to Van Loven, that are found in every photograph, which is the distance, angle, and gaze. And so looking at the distance is not really noteworthy. It's neither too far nor close, but the angle is. If you look, we talk about camera angle, we talk about the vertical angle and the horizontal angle. When you look at the vertical angle, would you describe it as upward, downward, or even? Down, right, exactly. So this denotes symbolic power over that person and exposes a strategy of disempowerment that is representing people as below us. In addition, the horizontal angle does not force us to face the person and therefore conveys detachment. In the case of this photo, it's clear there's no involvement on the part of the image. Uh, she's not made to look at the viewer. She's faceless. And so she's not addressing us directly. This variable is referred to as the gaze and reveals the strategy of objectivization, representing people as objects for scrutiny rather than subjects, addressing the viewer in their gaze and symbolically engaging with the viewer in this way. And so if I really had a pro-Romani ideology, I would not have chosen this photograph, okay? I might have chosen something like this. And when you look at this photograph, what do you notice about the distance? How would you describe the distance? Close. Oh, conveys intimacy. What about the angle? Equal, okay, and the gaze, yeah, you, you must connect with them, okay, you're forced to look at them, you're forced to engage, okay, and, and this to me would, would convey a pro-Ramani ideology. All right, so unfortunately uh, all of these terms and the context added up to many metaphors. The dominant metaphor was similar to Santa Ana's 1999 study of migrant workers in the LA Times where uh, Romanis are animals. Uh, there were some other lesser uh, common uh, metaphors, such as Romanis are debased people, Romanis are hunters, Romanis are trash. And I know some of you are probably thinking, well, these are crime reports. Of, of course, you're not going to have a positive representation. Um, well, number one, uh, I'm not saying just the person that committed the crime. I'm saying that Romanis as a group, as an entire ethnicity. Uh, so what we have here is a metonymy. We have one member being substituted or standing for the entire category. This is stereotyping. This is, this is bias. And the second point I wanted to make is that this is precisely why I did this comparison, because this is not at all what we find when we look at the Italian crime organizations. Okay, and I need to point out that most of the crimes that I looked at with Romani crimes were petty theft. There were a few exceptions. When we get to Italian crime organizations, we're talking about millions of euro drugs, arms, human trafficking, homicide, but yet we see a completely different story. And I just wanted to point out, I've been using this umbrella term of crime organizations or mafia, but really they're very distinct organizations. They operate in distinct areas, and the three most powerful at the moment are the ones that I looked at. Um, Cosa Nostra, most of you probably know of as mafia. Lindrangheta works out of the Calabria region, and La Camorra from the Naples area, okay? But uh, for the purposes of the paper, I looked at them all uh, together. So uh, what I found then, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I chose this photo is because one of the reports reported uh, the nickname of the mafioso was Scarface. Um, so what I found was very few examples, surprisingly, of denaturalization or derogation, but many examples of naturalization. And this is through many different ways, but one of them was through the use of nicknames, which convey an intimacy. 
body parts and relations, tied roots, organs, transplanted, and overwhelming use of kinship terminology. Okay, so we see father, son, mother, any time there was any family member, it was highlighted, it was repeated, and it was repeated. And this perpetuates the myth that Mafia is this family organization. Um, it began that way, but now, you know, globalization has reached the Mafia, and it's, <laughs> it's around the world, and it is no longer just a family structure, but they want this myth to continue. They want us to think that, and, and they have charge of that, obviously, because that's what we're seeing in the papers. So the dominant metaphor, then, for Mafia is, Mafia is our family. <laughs> uh, Mafia is Hollywood, Mafia is a plant, Mafia is a mystery. <laughs> um, yeah, and this all ties in with the idea of nationalism. Uh, we have the nation and the state, and in the family metaphor, the state becomes the custodian of the nation. And so how this is done is we incorporate the Mafia as the family of the nation. And how can we be against our family? It's us, right? We are the family. Um, so us versus them. So my question then becomes, uh, if the government has access to the media, and if you know, are familiar at all <laughs> with Silvio Berlusconi, you know that he owns most of Italians, uh, the Italian media. Um, so obviously they have access. So why is it in the government's interest to present the mafia favorably then? And I think the answer lies in the question, how much have those organizations infiltrated the Italian political system? And it really is in the Italian government's and the Mafia's interest to downplay Mafia crimes, while at the same time highlighting crimes committed by Romanis, as they provide an excellent distraction from the more serious crimes in which the government may play a role. And I do need to tell you that uh, it's real interesting, when you read the, the Romani crime reports, you're usually taken step by step. The victim tells you exactly what happened and reports all the, the bad details. When you have a mafia crime report, it's very difficult to even figure out what is the crime. Most of the report is all about the blitz and the mega blitz and the maxi blitz and the officers and their names and the nicknames and who's in the family member. By the time you get to the end of the article, you have to read back and try to figure out what was the crime. It's hardly even listed. So when I say downplay, that's what I'm talking about. And I wanted to point out, this, uh, that's uh, Silvio Berlusconi in the middle there. Um, <laughs> It's really no, no surprise to most Italians that there's some uh, association there. There have been uh, connections made between Berlusconi and the Mafia, but uh, no clear evidence has been presented against him yet. Uh, and the people I should mention on either side of them are ministers in his former administration that have been accused of Mafia-type associations. Uh, it's, it's very well known that there's, there's something going on there. All right, so in conclusion, then, this negative and biased representation of Romanis in crime reports provides the underpinnings for public policies and practices. And these policies demonstrate the systematic violation of Romanis' human rights, includes forced evictions, fingerprinting of children, as mentioned earlier, and abusive raids. Um, when combined with the downplaying of crimes committed by Italian criminal organizations, this helps keep the Mafia in power. And so my recommendations would be that we need to be conscious of the ideologies behind everyday discourse such as crime reports. Crime reports are especially, like many genres, especially dangerous because we think of them as these transparent views of reality, uh, that they're just reporting facts. But instead, they're actually packed full of ideologies. And we need, to, we need to be aware of this and we need to teach our students how to decode and demystify them. And. Um, recommendations to the hopefully outgoing Italian government to stop use of harsh policies toward Romanis for political gain, stop letting the Romanis be scapegoats to distract from more serious crimes committed by Italian crime organizations and ineffective governing. And just so you don't have a completely negative impression of Italy, here's a nice little photo. Thank you.